Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a wonderful weekend. We've got kind of a fun call today talking about um, things that will help you compete against your biggest competitor. And along with that, we've got uh, Jerry wants to kind of bring everybody up to speed on some things that have changed on the product side. So we're going to start out with Jerry, and then we'll get on to the things that can help you take clients away from your biggest competitor. So what's we got today, Jerry? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Mike. Appreciate it. Let me get my screen here over. Um, everybody can see this. The Asset Shield bonus ten. Wanted to well, discuss can. with you guys. Beautiful. Uh, what I think is actually pretty exciting is, um, you know, with all the interest rate changes and things that we've had over the last six to eight to nine months, there, you know, it, it takes a little while, but carriers are starting to figure out new ways to be competitive, to be able to pull niches, and to be able to do kind of new things out there. And one of the the fun ones is. American Equity, who um, all of us you know knew way back in the past, has always been that guaranteed lifetime income type of a carrier, and 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 they work in a lot of the broker dealers uh, as well out there. They finally uh, launched a bonus product that actually has some pretty good rates on it. So I wanted you guys all to be aware. But they launched this. Uh, it was a week ago on Wednesday, so about a week and a half ago, coming up on two weeks ago. And I think it's a pretty exciting product. Want to make sure everybody knew about it. What we typically knew in the annuity space was when you had a product that had a bonus on it, um, you were going to have some some pretty atrocious caps. And so a lot of times we would stick and stay away from those types of products. Um, but because of where interest rates are now these days, we can actually get a really good bonus and then we can still get really competitive rates, something that you would feel really good about using and actually putting your client in. And I'll give you kind of just some examples of where that can be of, uh, before I get into the product real quick, of how that can be uh, of, of great help to you is, you know, over the last maybe, you know, over the last maybe five years, you maybe might look through your book and say, hey, I have some products in here that have a cap or a rate in there, you know, at two or three or four or five percent. Um, you're going to find out in a second here um, with having a nine percent S&P cap on this. Heck, you know, if there's a little surrender charge, 10 percent bonus can probably more than cover a lot of those out there. And you can help put someone, put your client in an exciting position to be able to have a little bit more return. I think that's a really good thing to be able that you can feel great about kind of going and helping someone out with and talking with them about not to mention there's other scenarios too as well, like you know, maybe there's a little bit of a, a market loss someone might have and you want to go help them make that right a little bit there, make them feel good coming over as long, you know, helping them save money, you know, re, you know, you know, reducing any risk in the future, but also make up for some of those losses. Or, or maybe there's a, a bank CD someone's nervous with and they may want to break, break to get into something a little bit safer, like an insurance company with fixed index. Annuity. You got that 10% premium bonus that can help out with that. But um, without any further ado, so the Asset Shield, we're all probably familiar with that. They have the Asset Shield bonus, um, bonus 10, has the 10% premium bonus. They don't have the bonus version in their five or seven year, if any of you guys were wondering about that, just in the 10 year. But the 10% premium bonus still got the 10% free withdrawal on it. Product rights 18 to 80, and the bonus is good all the way up through age 82. Someone had asked me that last week. You get the bonus even at those older ages. Um, kind of a, a cool part, minimum premium is $5,000. This is a flexible premium product. So you can go ahead. I, I know a lot of people like to use it for flexing premiums in on an annual or monthly basis. They have a nice little form. You could fill it out and do automatic um, deposits in this thing on a monthly basis. Well, let's look at the caps here a little bit too. Um, right here, I was just kind of talking about, and this is right now, guys, I think like uh, to be able to just get S&P 500, I think, uh, you know, over the last hundred years, you know, including dividends, I think the S&P 500 was around 9%. Heck, if I can get an S&P cap at 9% right now, I mean, that's out of this world. No cap or spread on that. Uh, monthly point to point, 1.9%. The S&P annual point to points at 30%. I don't love that right now because I can get 100% of the market up to 9% with S&P cap. That's, that's fantastic. That's where we're going to put a lot of the money at. But they do have, if you guys are familiar with this product, they have their SG Global Sentiment prod, um, Index here on a one-year and a two-year at 100%, 140% par. The S&P Dividends Aristocrat, it's been uh, this has been, you know, one of the longest standing volatility control index options on here. They have it in a one year and a two year at 100 and 140 percent par, respectively. And then their Bank of American Credit Suisse, both at 
100% par, no cap on the one year, and then 140 on on the two year there. But um, fixed rate 2.9%. Uh, what the things like I'm highlighting here for sure is the S&P cap at nine. That's outstanding, and to be able to get that 10% a bonus on it. If you're looking back at some old business and some old news you might be looking at, you're probably seeing things maybe two, three, four, five percent. If I could double or even triple where someone's at, it's a nice option to, to look at. And then the surrender charge uh, schedule on this thing is really reasonable too. You can see you're starting at 9.1% and kind of reducing by about 1% each year. And then there is a vesting schedule. So in terms of accumulation and everything, um, the bonus is in there immediately. But if you're going to surrender it later on down the road, they have a, a schedule there that kind of follows that too as well. Um, and then one other thing to kind of note about this product here too, kind of the last uh, kind of thing I want to chat about it on is they uh, uh, American Equity is probably the easiest company out there to do a Roth conversion with. And they do something called a partial Roth conversion. And that's kind of a cool play when you get a 10% premium bonus talking about helping out with paying taxes. But um, what makes their product so unique when it comes to doing Roth conversions is you can actually put, you could just take for the sake of the conversation, I could put a million dollars in this thing, million dollars in it. And then I could go ahead and say, all right, um, with most products, you have to convert the whole amount that's in there. With them, I could say, all right, I want to convert $100,000 this year. And then it just slides over into a mirrored account, just like the IRA one that you have, except for just slides over into the Roth version of the account. And it doesn't add any new surrender charges. You don't have to take out like another application, anything like that. It just slides on over to that side. So you have a Roth side and a qualified side. And then the next year I could say, hey, you know what, the way things are working out, I just want to convert 50,000 of it. And then you can slide 50,000 over into the the Roth side of it. And then you have your choices of paying taxes. You can go ahead and you could, uh, you have up to your 10% free withdrawal where you could have them withhold some money out of the contract to do that. I don't recommend it because um, you can also shore up at the end of the year with Uncle Sam and just pay the taxes out of a different account. If you know, if, if you can, that's the best way to do it. Just be so you can make, take the maximum um, amount of, uh, have the maximum amount of money going over into Roth. Because as we all know, there's only so many ways you can get money into Roth. And the quickest way to get money into Roth is with conversions. So I would say don't waste that IRA money that you have you can convert. But um, if you have questions about it, you know, more than welcome. Give myself, Dan, Matt a call. I think this is a, a nice product to consider. If you have some specific cases to talk about, um, just go ahead, give Matt, myself, or Dan. Happy to go over it too as well. And then I think this is going to be in pretty much most broker dealers. We have a BD as well uh, uh, very shortly. So I think that's pretty exciting. So that's uh, that's the exciting news I got today, Mike. Well, uh, it's great. And I want to just reiterate, you, you, you did talk about this, but I just want to reiterate and make it clear that um, our top producers, guys, in the last two years have moved people. And then thank God they did a lot. Some of them just look like superheroes to their clients because they moved their clients both before the market started correct and also while the market was correcting over into FIAs and then have been moving 10% a year back into the marketplace. But what Jerry is talking about is that, you know, with this 10% bonus, guys, people have taken losses on their asset management accounts. They've taken losses in that asset management accounts. And if you went to them and said, listen, here's, here's the, here's what I'd like to do. Let's move it to a, an account that will, with a 9% cap, with a 9% cap where you're going to get the vast majority of the market if it does go up, but if it goes down, we won't lose any money, and we can make back 10% of what we lost so far, and then over time, we'll start moving it back into the marketplace. Do you think your clients are going to be interested in that? How many clients would be interested in that? Now, keep in mind, too, by doing that, whose um, theory are we following? Because remember, Kitsis and Wade Foe, again, as far as I'm concerned, the foremost experts in research on uh, financial planning, they say as a, as a uh, retiree, you should start out with how much money in the market? Very little, 30% of your money in the market, and then over time, you put the money back into the market. So by doing that, all the numbers show that that's the best way to do it. For when I started 
financial planning back 30 years ago, it was the opposite of that, right? As you get older, you got to put more and more into save. It should match your age. So if you're 60 years old, 60% should be in the market and 40% should be safe. And then as you get to 70, it should, uh, I'm sorry, 40% in the market, 60% safe. And as you get to 70, it should be um, 30% in the market and 70% safe. That's the opposite of what what the actual numbers show, isn't it? it might, that might seem correct on the surface, but when you, when they crunch the numbers, you should be at 30%, or I'm sure you should be at 30%, and then move more and more into the market. So does this product help you do that with your clients? Yeah, it's, it's perfect for that. And our biggest producers have done that, and they're still doing that today, because some of the people they visited and they did not want to move from the market into FIAs and then dollar cost average back in, they've called them up and said, uh, you know that thing you talked about, I wanna do that. And this is a great product to do that with. And how much are you giving up? With a 9% cap, how much are you giving up with the marketplace? Because at this point, are your retirees, are, is your job to make them rich? Or is your job to make them, keep them ahead of inflation and keep them happy? Does that make sense? So this is the very apropos, Jerry, for what's going on right now. A lot of clients are interested in getting out of the market and into something uh, safer. So thank you for doing that. Let me get back to where I'm at. So here's how you can get people to move from their, uh, your biggest competitor. These are 11 secrets Wall Street doesn't want you to know. More importantly, your biggest competitor doesn't want your clients to know. So I'm gonna walk through that. We do this about every three years, so it's been about three years since I've covered this. So number one, I don't want you to know about any of the fees, but especially about the hidden fees. So guys, what are hidden, what kind of fees can be hidden? What's the biggest hidden fee? How many of you know that? How, what's the biggest hidden fee that they, if we get, they get hit with? If you don't know the answer to this, you need to learn the 21 point checklist. Guys, if you can point out to your clients a huge fee that's not on the, the client statements, that's not um, been reported to them, that's not in, the, in their, um, Disclosure, very good, Nick's got it. How, how angry is that client gonna be that their advisor did not show that to them? So I've got one advisor right now. Nope, M&E is reported, isn't it? You can see, do they have to report the M&E fees, guys? That's not a hidden fee, that's an actual fee. And that's bad, you're right, Bert, that is bad. What's worse is when a fee is hidden, not 12B1. Okay, Steve's got it, good job, Steve. Okay, now we're getting, Artie's got it, Larry's got it. It's turnover, turnover. According to a study done by Wake Forest University and the University of Florida, the 30 largest mutual funds would have had to increase their published expenses by 43% if they included the hidden fees caused by turnover. Guys, that would be 43% more on top, or, or, or that take their M&E fees or their 12B1 fees and multiply that times 1.43%, how much is that going to boost those fees? Remember, Jerry just talked about what's the, what is the market average over 100 years? What's the market average over 100 years? Rate of return. Or 50 years or 25 years. Yeah, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, depending on which period you take. But if, if we take, let's just make it easy and give you the benefit of the doubt because it is not higher than 10%. But the highest anybody could ever use is 10%. Even if we use 10%, what's the average fees that people pay? 1%, if you add 1.43, or 43% of that is 1.43. If you, so on a 10% rate of return, how much of that return are they losing every single year based on the fees and the turnover? This is not a VA, a VA it gets even worse. They're gonna be losing a quarter, 25% of their return every year. How much are they losing when they have a 1% fee and then the turnover is another 43% that's not being reported? And guys, do you understand why turnover is a hidden fee? If you don't, you haven't looked at the 21-point checklist because that, the, the sad thing is if you don't, the guys that use the 21-point checklist, when they walk through it with their clients, their clients can tell you they're not even financial advisors. They're not even licensed, and they could tell you why a turno the turnover costs them money. So if you can't explain that, that's, you're in a bad situation when um, our top advisor's clients could explain it better than you. 
So you need to get dive in there and uh, under the 21 point checklist and learn why turnover is such a huge problem. So if if a client found out that 43% of their they're, and not because you say so, but because they say so, that they're being charged 43% more than the client has disclosed, how happy are they going to be with their advisor? If they're being charged 43% more than their advisor disclosed, how happy is that client going to be? Is that going to help you move them from their current advisor? Some Forbes, how much do mutual funds really cost? Study said that the average reduction and return per 100% turnover was 0.41%, this uh, uh, 0.53% for mid-cap and 0.87% for international stock. So depending on where you look for turnover, there's lots of different, um, and we actually calculate it with you with, calculate it for you. You don't even have to calculate it. We calculate it for you in the 21-point checklist. So if you're not using that software, you're missing the boat. Also, if it's a taxable account, the tax efficiency is incredibly bad. Because if it has a high turnover and it's not in a, a, a qualified account, what's the gains rate going to be, short term or long term? So they're going to be paying twice as much tax as they would have normally have to pay. The average cost of tax efficiency is about 1.1% for non-qualified money. Beware of hidden costs lurking in mutual fund portfolio. So number is so oh, let me go back up here. This is out of Kiplinger's. So guys, there are lots of different places that you can get va find validation that that turnover is costing your clients or better yet, your prospects tons of money. That's the first uh, thing that's, uh, and how many, how many clients, that, or how many prospects, if you ask them what the turnover ratio was of their accounts would be able, what percentage of clients would be able to tell you that? What percent of clients even would understand what turnover ratio is? So you got one person, two persons, thanks Larry, yeah, zero, zero percent. Number two, stocks don't necessarily keep you in inflation. What's the number one reason brokers tell you you need to be in stocks? To stay ahead of inflation. Yeah, do stocks keep you ahead of inflation? Sometimes, and guess what? Sometimes not. Let's look at periods from 1965 to 2022. So how many years is that, guys? How many years is that? Is that a fair period to look at? So from, t from 2000 to 2016, from 2000 to 2016, the average rate of return was 1.83%. Uh, so if you put in money at 2000, kept in 2016, the average rate of return is 1.83%. Would that have kept you ahead of inflation, guys? NASDAQ would have been 1%. Now, here, guess what some people say with this? What are we not including here, guys? When we look at this, what are we not including? Dividends, okay? What are we also not including, guys? Fees. So when you look at the dividends and you look at the fees, guess what they do? They cancel each other out. So this is a valid number. And we got NASDAQ. NASDAQ doesn't have dividends, or very, basically no dividends, plus the fees. So this could actually be zero rate of return if you look at, uh, if you add fees in there. And if you look at a dollar in 2000, it's worth $1.39 in 2016. The average, the average inflation rate was 2.10. So did it keep you ahead of inflation from zero, either the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ? Did either one of those keep you ahead of inflation for those 16 years? Everybody answer. I got two people, three people answering. Everybody answer that. N or Y, yes or no. Now, I'm not cherry picking. We're going to go through all the years, but during that period, so that 16 years, it did not. Now, let's look at another period. From 1965 to 1982, the consumer price index, the consumer price index, what bought $100.65 would have cost $306 in 1982. The S&P 500, 100, uh, uh, putting in $100 in the S&P 500 would have grown to 166. So did that period right there, did that keep you ahead of inflation, even close to ahead of inflation? Give me a Y or an N there. 
Not even close. In fact, inflation was twice as fast as the market grew. So even with great annual returns, like over the past few years, there's still issues. So from 2020 to 2022, the Consumer Price Index, what bought 100 would have bought 114. This Fed 500 grew to 118. Is that, that's keeping ahead of inflation, but by how much? A lot or basically a little bit? So it has kept you ahead of inflation, but not by much. So if you look at the, so we looked at 2000 to 2016, 1965 to 82, it did not keep you ahead of inflation. The other from 82 to 2000, it did. So what we have is a 17 year period where it lagged inflation. 1983 to 99, 17 years, it was ahead of inflation. 2000, 2016, 17 years, lagged inflation. 2017, 2019, ahead of inflation, but by how much, a lot or a little? It's slightly ahead of inflation. So that means 34 of the past 57 years, 60% of the time, the stock market did not keep up with inflation. If you show this, if you show this to your competitor's clients, would they be shocked? Or would they say, oh yeah, 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 he covered that with me. Guys, 17 years and you don't keep up with inflation twice, twice, is that problematic? If you, is that problematic? If you were counting on that to keep your head on inflation. So I'm not, you know, the, uh, what I'm, am I saying stocks are bad here? No, I'm saying what your competition is telling your clients is a big fat what? Either they're stupid or they're lying. And as far as your prospects are concerned, what's better, that their advisor is stupid and doesn't know this, or they're lying? Which one is better? Do you want your banker, do you want the person handling your money to be stupid or lying to you? I hope you get this answer right. We got some right answers here and some non-right answers here. Yeah, neither. You want, that's right, Larry. Neither, Tom, neither. I don't want them to be, do I want them lying to me or do I want them to be stupid? No, I don't want them to be either. And either way, if they're not telling their clients this, if they're saying stocks will keep you ahead of inflation, but they don't add sometimes, in fact, 40% of the time, over the last 60 years, 40% of the time it'll keep you ahead of inflation, but 60% of the time it will not, and there'll be 17 year time periods will it, where it will not keep you ahead of inflation. Would that be something clients would want to know? Yeah, I would think so. Also, average rate of return is a big fat lie. Again, if you know the FIA presentation, you'll know this, right? Because put in 100, lose 50, make, or I'm sorry, you make 100%, double your money, lose 50, double your money, lose 50%. What's that average? What's your average rate of return there? 100 minus 50 is 50, plus 100 is 150. I'm sorry, yeah, 50, plus 100, I'm sorry, I did that wrong. 100, lose half, you're down to 50. Double it by going up 100%, you're back to 100. You lose 50, you're back to, so what's your average, your average return is um, 25%, but what would have happened to your money? Over here, you got up 20, down zero, up 20, down zero, your average return is what? Total percent is 40%. Average rate of return is 10%. So which is better? An average rate of return 25% or an average rate of return of 10%? Well, if you begin with 100, doubling your money is what? 200. Losing 50% is 100. Doubling your money is 200. Losing 50% is what? 100. Which means you made how much money? You start out with 100, ended up with 100, you made how much? Zero. Zero percent rate of return. So it was an average of 25%, but in reality, you only made zero percent. Over here, start with 100, you go up to 120, lose nothing. 144, lose nothing. So you made $44, average rate return is 11%. How many of your clients would understand this? How many of your prospects would understand this? Is this explained by their current advisor? How many of your competitors use average rates of return? Use the term average rate of return. All of them do. Would your clients be surprised or prospects be surprised at this? Number four, if you stay in the stock market for the long haul, you'll be okay. 
if these are real, if this is really the case, let me ask you a question. If you stayed in the stock market for a long period of time, you'll be okay. Well, let's let's think about this. What if 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 brokerage houses truly believe this? If when the, their stockbroker truly believe this, they could double their profits. Why? They presently make one percent per year on expense charges. How many of your clients would would uh, want a guaranteed six percent rate of return over the next ten years? If you could give them a guaranteed 6% rate of return over the next 10 years, would clients say yes to that? Some of them. How many? If you could sell a 6% guaranteed rate of return over the next 10 years, could you sell a lot of that stuff? A lot. So then if that was the case, if the brokers really believed, really believed that the market's a good place to be, why don't they do this? Why don't they guarantee their client 6% rate of return? And if they know over the next 10 years, the market's going to average 7%, 8%, or 9%, they could make what? 1%, 2 or 3% instead of just 1%. That would double, triple their, their profits. Why wouldn't they want to do that? If they truly believed over 10 years, the market's going to be okay, why wouldn't they just guarantee 6% and then pocket the difference? Because why? Everybody answers, why won't they do that? Do they really know? Are they going to bet this? Are they going to bet the market's going to make more than 6% over the next 10 years? But do they tell their clients that bullshit? Pardon my French. Do they tell their clients that the market's going to average more than 6% over the next 10 years? I got one yes. Come on, guys. How many of your competitors are saying, if you hold on for 10 years, you're going to average 7, 8, 9% rate of return? Yeah, almost all of them. So do they really believe this? No, they don't offer it because they don't know what the market's going to do over the next 10 years. My guy is not the best. There is no best money manager. How do we know there is no best money manager? How do we know that? Because if there was, how many money managers would there be? One, and in fact, how many money managers are there? Thousands. The S&P 500 index outperformed hedge funds, and you all know this, or you should all know this, because I talk about it pretty regularly. Warren Buffett took the top 10 hedge fund managers, and he bet them over the next decade that the S&P 500 would beat the hedge funds, and did it. This is what the average hedge fund did, this is what the market did. So even on a yearly basis, did they beat the market ever? Did they? So if the hedge funds, hedge funds are, and who puts money into hedge funds, guys? Stupid people or very smart people with a lot of money and do a lot of due diligence? Who puts money into hedge funds? The rich that you have a lot of uh, uh, due diligence, et cetera. And so when they put their money there, they can't even beat the S&P 500. Not a single hedge fund, top hedge fund. Not a, Ray Dalio, did Ray Dalio beat the, head, beat the market? No, nobody did. Funds that went from hero to zero. Look at these, <laughs> this is just examples. Uh, uh, 2020 20 rank was the 12th, then it went to 99th. 2021 and 2021, 10th ranked, 95th percentile, 14th percentile, 89th percentile, 12th percentile, 87th percentile, 2nd percentile, 82nd percentile, 3rd percentile, 85th. Why? Why does this happen, guys? When the market, when, when any fund manager does great this year, how did they do, how did they beat the market this year? By taking more or less risks in the market. Yeah, you're right, uh, Steve, luck. And Bert, rock, luck. They took more risk than the market. And when you take more risk in the market and you're right, you're right. But when you take more risk in the market and you're wrong, you're what? You're really wrong. You're really wrong. Number six, bonds are no longer a safe place for your money. Is that going to take it? <laughs> Clients that have been in bonds and didn't heed, you didn't heed my, my warning three years ago and you did not take your clients out of bonds, how, how happy are they with you and your expertise Right now, if you left them in bonds instead of putting in FIAs, I tell you what, they're not very happy. 
Bonds are not a good place for your safe money. Number seven, past performance is no guarantee of future performance. They talk, but they don't walk the walk. We just went through an example of that. If they did believe this, they would give guarantees, but they don't. If they really believe this, they would throw away their mountain charts and tables showing the past performance instead of adding necessary verbiage in the small print of the bottom. Guys, when, they, when a mutual fund or a VA shows that mountain chart, what do they always say? Past performance does not indicate, uh, uh, indicate any relationship whatsoever with future performance. If that was truly the case, should it be in small print or should it be as big as the mountain chart? Should it be as e if, if that was, if um, the SEC and the FINRA was doing their job, should that be small print or should that be as, as easily readable and discernible as that mountain chart is? It should be just as big. Number eight, there's a reason they've mistitled your accounts. They, they reason, why don't they uh, title accounts? The banks don't title them POD and the brokers don't title them TOD. Why do they do that? Because they get to make money on you when you're dead and then they're gonna try to do the same thing to your kids. Again, this is right out of the 21 point checklist script. Actively managed accounts, do not beat the index regularly enough to validate paying any fees. Simply put, you wouldn't pay a fee to be in first class every flight if some, sometimes you got to be in first class, but most times you didn't. Guys, what percentage of funds beat the market? Over one year periods, three year periods, five year periods. Look at small cap growth. By the end of, by the, end of the 15, what, how, how many? How many are how many are beating the market? Less than ten percent. What does the best money manager in the world recommend people put their money in? Where is he told his wife to put his money? Where did he tell his wife to put his money when he dies? His wife and LeBron James. Where did he tell LeBron James to put his money? Could LeBron James have who? I mean, how many money managers are beating down LeBron James's door? trying to manage his money you think a few or a gazillion guess where he has his money s p 500 some mutual funds are pricier than others here's uh when they may benefit investors so active <laughs> average fund cost by category this is uh so you look at active funds index funds so in every single category the active funds what cost a little more or a lot more a little more or a lot more a lot more active versus index funds returns over the past 10 years by category so how often do active funds when you're paying more how often do they beat the market foreign 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 I'm sorry, foreign, not, not here. Then we got real estate. Well, a foreign. So if, if you're going to have an active managed fund from this chart, if you're going to have an active managed fund, you should only be investing that fund into what? International, that's right. International, international, or foreign. Otherwise, every domestic one will be some managed accounts. In every single, and there's a long, I'm going to have a whole discussion on why it makes sense to have foreign funds actively managed, but basically it's because why? More or less people invest in the foreign, foreign accounts or, or foreign markets versus the U.S. Everybody invests in the U.S. The reason, so basically the market is always going to beat the managed funds. You can find gems in the foreign market because there's not nearly as much research, not nearly as much firepower that goes looking at foreign marketplaces. But my guy is really good. My guy is really good though. Guys, if your guy is really good, should he be giving you a guarantee? Should he be giving your clients a guarantee? How many of you know the one question, if you want to completely bury your advice, your comp competition, and the client's saying, well, how would I know whether he's any good or not? You'd say, well, ask him this one question. What does he know about long-term capital management? 
And if he can't give you a summary of what happened to long-term capital management, you should run away from that guy as quickly as possible. Guys, if I offered you a fund that was, that was managed by two Nobel Prize winning economists in the financial markets, two Nobel Prize winning economists in the financial markets, and it was back tested, and it was back tested for 50 years, and it beat the market every single year, how much of your money would you put there? We're on by two Nobel Prize winning economists in the financial markets and back us it for 50 years and beat the market every single year. How much money would you put there? Well, that's what long-term capital management was. Scholes and Merton, two Nobel Prize winning economists in the financial marketplace. John Merriweather considered one of the best stock pickers in his generation. And what happened to long-term capital management? when genius failed. If your advisor can't answer this one question, who is long-term term capital management and how does it affect me? You should fire them. Why? Because long-term capital management tanked. They beat the market for two years and then they tanked. And then just like happened to SVB and Credit Suisse, et cetera, only it was done behind the scenes because long-term capital management was a private company. The governments of Germany, Japan, Britain, and, and the United States bailed out long-term capital management because basically every large-term institutional investor was heavily invested in long-term capital management because guess, when you got two Nobel Prize-winning economists in the financial marketplace and back tested for 50 years, guess what the minimum investment was? Started out at 10 million, and this is back in the late 90s. Started out at 10 million, when 10 million is a lot of money, and then it made it all the way up all the way up to $50 million. Because as, as more and more money poured in, they made the minimum bigger and bigger and bigger. And these institutional investors, smart guys or dumb guys, a lot of due diligence, no due diligence. All these, if, if the, these governments, Germany, Japan, US and Great Britain had not bailed the, this company out, it would have been Armageddon in the financial markets. But they quietly bailed them out three years before, or two or three years before the 2000 market crash. The 1998 failure of long-term capital management is said to have nearly blown up the world's financial system. Its failure threatened to create major losses for its Wall Street lenders. Long-term capital management was so big that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York took the unprecedented step of, to facilitate a bailout of a private hedge fund out of fear that a forced liquidation might ravage world markets. See, it beat, it started out in 94, beat the market, beat the market, beat the market, beat the market for four years, and then what happened? got killed. So what does this tell you about somebody who's saying that they've got a great manager? Do they have two Nobel Prize winning economists in the financial markets? Do they have a, something back tested for 50 years? Do they have a, a funds that the, the smartest people in the world, these institutional investors, have done diligence on and then basically invest? Guys, why is it impossible for any of our clients to have the best manager out there? Give me one reason. I'll tell you one reason why. Why is it impossible for any of our clients to have the best manager out there? I agree with you, Steve. Nobody, nobody can do it. But if they were the best money manager out there, what would the minimum investment be? Could any of your clients afford um, <laughs> what it would take to put money into the best money manager out there? So any money manager telling you that they've got it figured out is full of what? I'm not saying money managers are bad. I'm just saying they're what? I'm not saying money managers are bad. I'm just saying what? They're all what? What am I saying? They're all the same. They're all the same. And one year, one manager is going to be, to be better than another, and the next year, the other manager is going to be better than them. It's just, it's, 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 nobody's got it figured out. If they did, they'd be attracting who? They'd be attracting the highest net worth people in the country, and they would not allow. I mean, 
Guys, if they have a million dollars, a million dollar minimum, <laughs> does that tell you you got a great manager? A million dollar minimum. Boy, they must be really good because they have a million dollar. Guys, if they were really that good, would it be a million dollars or would it be 50 or 100 million dollars would be the minimum? See, they say things all the time. They say things all the time because they're what? And, and again, because of my net worth, I get calls all the time from people uh, with all these great investments. And guess what I say? Awesome, 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 awesome. Uh, yeah, you, you got it. I'm going to put, in fact, I'll put half of my net worth in there, half my net worth in there. So here's all I ask for you. And what's the question I ask them? Because they're telling us, no, are you sure? This is the way it works. Yeah. So, and, and, and you, you this is the kind of return I can expect. Absolutely. That's, you know, we've done all the testing, blah, blah, blah. This is the kind of return you can expect, blah, 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 blah. Then I ask him one question. What do I ask? That's right. <laughs> Steve's got it. Very good, Steve. Ah, you are a great, <laughs> you have a great memory. I say, all I ask is this, go ahead and uh, send me the paperwork, also with a contractual guarantee that you will give me your house if it does not perform the way that you say it's going to perform. And then what happens to that conversation at that point? And when do they ever call me again? They're all about what? They're all about the promises, all about the projections, all about, yes, this is the way it's going to work. Yes, this is what you should expect until we ask them to what? Put their money up. Then what happens to all those projections, all those, it's, it's going to work this way. I'm confident in this. How confident do they become when you ask them to put their money on the line? It evaporates. So number 10, here's the, the 10th thing that they don't want you to know. I don't want you to know about the preferred. Guys, if you work with an Edward E. Jones person, where does that client have their money 95% of the time? If you work with an Edward E. Jones person, uh, client, uh, uh, American funds, right, Tom? American funds. Why? Why do they have American funds? Because American funds does what with Edward E. Jones? They're at, American funds is on Edward E. Jones' preferred list. And why does Edward E. Jones do that? Yeah, they get kickbacks. And do they report that? To the client, yes. Where? Where do they report that? Mark, is sent, Mark sends me once a year the reports from Edward e. Jones and the small print from prospects that he gets in front of uh, one of our uh, great um, um, advisors. And, and it's always there, but where is it? It's buried way in the back in the small print that they get kickbacks from American funds. I know you hired me to find you absolutely the best solution to your problems. He says that my company only wants me to look at solutions that they make the most money. I, the reason I quit, a bank, I was a bank advisor, and the reason I quit bank advisor because it was, uh, it was Norwest Bank here in Minneapolis, and we could sell whatever funds we wanted, and then when Wells Fargo bought us, guess what they said? They said 90% of our funds needed to be what? Wells Fargo. So guess what I did? Quit. Why? Because of all the thousands of funds out there, what's the likelihood that Wells Fargo has the best funds? Well, I'll tell you, zero for Wells Fargo. American funds have some good funds, but of all the thousands of funds out there, are American funds the best funds out there? They're good funds. Don't get me wrong. They're good. But of all the funds out there, are they the best funds out there? No. And when a client hires us, they would hire us to do what? Sell what our company tells us to sell or that company gets kicked back on? or they find the best, they're looking for the best. We've already talked about mutual funds and the sneaky behavior they handle. How much do they cost? Well, according, according now, when you add preferred for the companies that do this, when you add the preferred list to it, according to the University of Texas at Austin, University of Virginia, University of Missouri, Georgia State University, the additional cost of mutual fund sneaky behaviors is not the 0.43 that we talked about earlier, it's 2.49%, right out of Forbes, right out of Forbes. Number 11, here's the biggest thing. The little secret they can't tell you is they, they can't make you, advisor cannot make you happy. They can only make you sad. And guys, I've, I've talked to you about this over and over and over. What makes a client happy? If, if all of a sudden they get a 30% rate of return, they get excited, but do they get happy? They get excited, no doubt. And they may be happy, but how long does that happiness last? Or is it eph ephemeral? Guys, they say, you know, oh, boy, I made 30% last year, but I'm getting a divorce, but I'm still happy. Oh, I made 30%, oh, but my kid has cancer, but I'm still happy. Oh, I got 30% this year, but guys, does, it, does the rate of return make them happy? 
No, it makes them excited. What makes clients happy? Guys, what makes clients happy? What makes men happy? Sex. Victory of their favorite sports team. What makes women happy? Being with family, and sadly, losing weight. I wish that wasn't the case, but it is. Losing weight. What is, what is missing from these lists? Rates of return. Are they looking to become rich? If they drive a Cadillac now, do they want to drive a Ferrari next year? No, if they drive a Cadillac now, they want to make sure they can drive a Cadillac for the rest of their lives. If they drive a Ford F-150, what do they want to make sure they can do? Drive a Ford 150 for the rest of their lives. They're, they want to maintain their lifestyle. Are, is anybody that's retired looking to get rich in retirement? They wouldn't mind it, but is their goal to get rich when they're in retirement? Or is their goal to live the same lifestyle that they retired to? What do they do? To get rich or the same? Rich or same? So R for rich, S for the same. Which one? R or S? Rich, get rich, or have the same life? Yeah, they just want the same. They just want the same. So we have the worst jobs in the world. Because we can't make our clients happy. We can't. But can we make them sad? Getting a 30% rate of return makes them excited, but it does not make them happy. But here's the thing. Losing 30%? Losing 30%, does that make them sad? Oh, I lost 30%, but I guess I still have my uh, health. No, they're what? When they lose 30%, does it affect whether they want to go out to eat? next weekend, whether they want to go to uh, Florida or Europe or uh, uh, next year, whether they're going to do a stay vacation or go spend money on a plane. To, do, if they lose that kind of money, does it make them unhappy? Does it affect their lifestyle? Did they drive that car an extra year or two instead of getting the new one they wanted? Do they not get to redo the remodeling that they wanted to do, not get the new deck that they wanted? Does it make them happy? Yes, it does. So we have the worst jobs in the world. We can't make them happy, but we can certainly make them unhappy. So are all the people who have money happy? No. Do all the happy people have money? No. Is their goal in retirement to enjoy family, enjoy traveling, enjoy friends, explore their faith, uh, leave a positive mark on before they leave the earth, enjoy life? Is this what they're after? Or are they looking to, to get the highest re rate of return possible? They just want to make sure what? They can continue to enjoy their family comfortably, enjoy traveling comfortably, enjoy their friends comfortably, enjoy, explore their faith comfortably, leave a positive mark. Uh, before they leave the earth comfortably. What they don't want to do is end up going in the uh, uh, poor house because is their goal to do those things or to be wealthy? It's those things. Is it money that makes them happy no, or is it the financial security that allows them to be happy? It's not so much the money, it's what money does for us. Should your client's money run out, uh, run their retirement or should the retirement run their money? What do I mean by this? Should they only go on vacation when their money's doing well and not when their money's doing poorly? That's money running your retirement. Retirement running their money is they live every single year, they live the lifestyle they want. So what do they really want? Highest return with the least amount of risk or a return that gives them what they want or without the risk of losing what they already have. What do they want? They want the highest return with the least amount of risk, a return that gives them what they want, keeps and without the risk of losing what they already have. That's what they want. Does having money in the market in an FIA do these things? And again, especially for using the Kitsis Wade full mentality of starting out with 30% in the market, 70% guaranteed, and then dollar cost averaging into the market. Does it do these three things? And how many of your clients, if, if you ask them, hey, would you like the highest return with the least amount of risk? How many would say yes, 100%? Hey, would you want a return that gives you the same lifestyle that you've always wanted when you retired? What would they say? Yep. Do you, do, do you want a, a, a portfolio that, without the risk of losing what you already have? What would they say? Yes. See, 80, stocks are right 80% of the time, but stocks are wrong 20% of the time. So we, should we risk everything on the odds? Guys, if I, was, if I was to give you a double or nothing on $10, a bet on $10, would you do it? Sure. But if I said double or nothing in your house, would you do that? And when we're talking about retirement, are we talking about a side bet for $10? Are we talking about the equivalent of their house if we're betting their retirement dollars? 
So if they want to be wild and crazy, should they be doing it with all the retirement accounts or how much of their retirement accounts? A large exposure or a small exposure? Because guys, it can go on for a long time. This is what happened to the Nikkei. 1970, boom, 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 boom. Real estate crisis, what happened to the, the Nikkei market? Boom, boom, boom. And now what do we got? 10, 20, 30, 35 later, how, 35 years later, are we to where we were at the top? And this is a, a, a real estate implosion caused the, their stock market to get tank. Could this happen in the U.S.? Or is this, could, or we, or, how many of you are comfortable betting your house that this could not happen in the U.S.? Because I'm going to take you up on that bet. Yeah, and then Bert says, adjusting for inflation, it's even worse. Exactly. So it's not losing your money that makes you rich. And there's, I, I actually have a list of, I think it's like uh, um, 30 or 40 of the richest guys in the U.S. During, our, during the last 200 years. The richest guys are the last 200 years in the United States with their, with, where at some time in their life they made the quote that not losing your money, not exactly these words, not losing your money makes you rich, but basically the same mentality that it's not losing money that makes you rich. So 200 of the richest guys that ever lived in the United States all at one point in their life had this premise, which is not go out and try to make the most money possible, but make sure you don't lose money. That's what makes you rich. That's what Benjamin Graham said too. Graham was called teacher by Warren Buffett, Michael Price, Bill Gates, and 50-50% uh, portfolio for the average investor. That's what they should they said they should have. So we can do that one better. We do 50% of the market and 50% in an FIA. So guys, if you haven't gone through the FIA presentation, especially this participation rate one, or the bond one where we actually use Kitsis and Foe's um, portfolio recommendations, and some of this stuff is foreign to you, this is, make sure you can actually walk a client through these selling presentations. These selling presentations have been around. This one presentation has been around since 1997, and it still has the same exact closing ratios that had back then, which is over a 95% closing ratio. Why does it have a 95% closing ratio? Because in one hour, the client's going to tell themselves, not you tell them, the client's going to tell themselves 60 times to 100 times in an hour that this is where they want all their money. For those of you who have done this presentation, what is the number one objection that you have to overcome when you do this, when you're awesome at this presentation? What's the number one and really only objection you ever have to overcome? That's right, Tom's got it. See if anybody else gets it. If they tell themselves 60 to 100 times, this is the best place to have their money, better than CDs, better than bonds, better than the stock market, better than real estate, this is the best place to have your money, guess what the number one objection you have? Artie's got it. Why can't I put all of my money here? That's the objection you have to overcome. Why can't I put all of my money here? It's never, it's never uh, anything else, when you do it right, it is never anything, but why can't I put all of their money there? And that's, guys, that's an easy objection to overcome. They're not like, why should I put my money in this? I think I'm going to think about it. I'm, I'm going to wait and talk to my other advisor. Ooh, I'm going to talk to my accountant. It's none of those things. The number one objection we get is, why can't I put all of my money there? If you're not getting that objection and you're getting another objection, how well are you doing this presentation? Because I've asked guys since 2000, I've been using this since 1997, I've been asking guys for 2000, please send me a tape where you do the FIA presentation where the person doesn't want to put their money, all their money into it. Guess how many tapes have been sent to me in the last 23 years since 2000, where the, the, the advisor has done a good job, 90% good job, 90% on, uh, on the script, 90% uh, skill level with this or higher and the client didn't want to put all their money there. Guess how many times that's happened in 23 years? That's right, none, why? Why did it happen zero times? Because when you have a 90% skill level, when you have a 90% skill level, who is telling them they should invest in this 60 to 100 times? 
Who is telling them it's better than CDs or bonds? Who is telling them that it's better than the market? Who is telling them that it's better than any place they can actually put their money? They're telling themselves. And when somebody tells themselves this is better than any other place they can put their money, guess what they do with their money? They put it there. Does that make sense? So, is there anybody on the call that did not pick up a couple of ideas that they can use the next time they run into their competition? What's this a worthwhile call to do so you can have ammunition for when you run into your clients who think their advisor walks on water? Awesome. Cool. So I have top of the hour. We'll get started at five after the hour for the script presentation. What we're going to work on is the uh, trust and will portion. And it will only be about a 15-minute call. So we're starting about five minutes. It'll be a short call because we're going to work on the trust and the will portion of the 21-point checklist. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the week, and we will talk to you uh, next Monday. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.